Dog Podcast, the place to be to learn the best possible hacks to upgrade your dog. I'm so excited to introduce to you our today's guest. If you're a pet owner who always seeks for best possible tips how to make your dog live longer, you're gonna love this interview. Thomas is an animal naturopath, researcher, author, and the founder of a Long Living Pets Research Project. It is a 30-year study about dogs fed with raw food. Currently, over 5,000 dogs and 800 cats are participating in this study. The goal of the Long Living Pets Project is to have 10,000 dogs and 5,000 cats participating. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for making time to come and uh, talk in our podcast today. And first of all, I would like to thank you for all of your work you made in this 16, past 16 years. And it's really incredible what you're doing. And thank you so much. And I can't wait to share all of your experience with all the people who are watching us now. All right. Thank you for having me. It's 18 years. 18 years, okay, 18 years. Now, you see, this is the part where we can cut. <laughs> um, I think we can start with a simple uh, question about uh, Long Living Pets project. How, how this project was born or uh, what was the main driver behind the, all of this idea? Well, what started it is uh, plain and simple. I love Great Danes and I want them to live longer. So that was just the first first part of it because uh, I had Danes most of my life and one of the first things people see, oh my gosh, I love Great Danes, I had best dogs and it's, you know, they're seeing all these good things about it and then, but they live so short, you know, yeah. so that's always comes in the end, uh, they live so short, they live so short. Okay, I'm going to adopt a five or six year old Dane and, you know, I might you know, only have it for two, three years and then... It, you know, most of the things, you know, they don't live much longer than six to eight years. So that bothered me and that made me want to start this thing because I, I couldn't understand. Oh, well, I do did understand, but I thought I could make it be much, much longer and uh, even double. My goal was to double the lifespan of Great Danes by switching the diet. I knew it was the food. It couldn't be anything else. It has yeah. to be the food because the Danes we had in Norway were raw fed and they live much longer. And any dog, we had English setters. My mom was totally into English setters, lived into their 20s, and they were all raw fed. So I knew there was a diet. And when I saw Camp United States 20 some years ago, and I, that's the first time I really was exposed to kibble and, and that type of food. And when I got my first great thing here, I realized that's not going to happen. So I started feeding my, my Danes raw food and all that. But I started actually on a barf diet here because it was so yeah. popular here when I come and said, oh, maybe there's something to this. And I realized later, I can talk about that later, that that doesn't work so well for, at least for my dogs. So that's what started it. I wanted, and then I started documenting in my Danes and I started talking about it a little bit online and then some other people join in and, you know, well, yeah, let's see what, we, what happens when you start feeding a raw food diet. Because I, I thought that was the key. If you draw, then you're going to live longer. So that, but I didn't know. I was just guessing. And, you know, couldn't be anything else. I mean, vaccines, other yeah. things too. But there wasn't a big problem back then. The vaccine has just become crazier and crazier as, as we, you know. Yeah, to, you know, basically in the past five probably yeah. years. Yeah. And uh, wow. so that, I eliminated everything. I said, it has to be. And I started the digestive system on dogs. I've done that actually years before that. And. Um, because I'm interested in you know cellular communication, everything that goes on inside a dog and human yeah. and all that. So so I knew at that time that food is the number one thing. If you're not fed the right nutrients, nothing's going to happen. You know, yeah. in when it comes to optimal health. So that's what started it, and that's all I wanted to do. I want to double the age so of long, um, a great things and. Um, and what was the main, uh, maybe, uh, the, not like a, the goal, but what was the, the main point you noticed while you were feeding your dogs with raw food? I mean, did you notice some kind of a difference between kibble food and uh, raw food diet? Because, well, oh, yeah. all, you know, everything basically leads to immune system. So uh, can you maybe tell us more about the immune system, maybe imbalances if you're using a kibble diet and if you're using a raw food diet? Well, in my case, I, I also used the raw back from Norway, but there was the lifespan of 10 years 
that in the in the beginning uh, when I came for well, the end three or four years in Norway, I didn't have a dog because I did some other work. I couldn't have dogs. I traveled too much. And and I, you know, when I came to the United States, I didn't have a lot of dogs for the first five years. So when I started, uh, uh, I rescued dogs. So I, I tried to rescue Great Danes and I tried to get them you know, one year lower. Yeah. And all the dogs I rescued have always been kibble fed. So they come to me in a pretty bad situation where they smell a big poop, diarrhea. Most of them have diarrhea. And uh, some of them are on medication and those things. And switching to a raw food diet, and I always switch, um, I always get asked this, I switch in cold. I just fast them for 48 hours and then I start them on a raw food diet. But I only start on one type of meat, like chicken or something. Yeah. Till everything regulates itself and it looks good. And then I start slowly adding in other meat groups. I take a little bit of, you know, a couple ounces chicken out and then I put maybe some beef uh, or lamb or something else in there, depending on what I have. So the switch happens cold in a sense, like cold turkey, we, we call it here. And then, uh, but I started with one meat group and I found that to be, be pretty uh, effective and, and the dogs will adjust much faster than eat just one meat group. And still, you can even do that for one week, two weeks, three weeks, a month. If you fed chicken only for one month in the beginning, you're doing much, much, much better than kibble even. And you also, during that period, the body is kind of purging this, um, uh, these toxins or, or the chemicals and all that that contains in kibble. So just by removing that and having this um, uh, one meat group is, is still a tremendous difference from feeding just kibble. Yeah. So you're kind of removing the bad, you're putting something really, really good in, and you're going to be surprised if you really look into the uh, nutrients of chicken. It's pretty good. What I do actually during that chicken, I do add an egg in once or twice a week, and that makes a big difference too, of course, because there's a lot of nutrients in eggs. So yeah. what I see, of course, you see a much smaller poop coming out. Yeah. You know, that's the first thing you notice. You wonder what there's wrong here. There's nothing coming out. I just had in my case, like great thing, maybe three pounds of meat and yeah. out comes just a little bit like this out. And yeah. you, 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 in your mind, you're thinking, oh, wow, what is the rest of it? I, I know because meat contains 70% water. So yeah. most of this is absorbed by the body. So that's, you know, and other nutrients and it's more absorbable and then, than kibble. So less gonna come out, but this is what freaks most people out in the beginning when they're switching to a raw food diet is Wow, what there must be something stuck in my dog somewhere. You know, they yeah. think this, you know, something is clogged up. They just I was thinking like this as well. Yeah. And sometimes dogs have a little bit of sort of like a diarrhea, a little loose stool, and they strain, they look like they're straining to get it out. But it's yeah. just liquid that go coming out because the that part of the body is like the anus, the last little part of the body is super, super, super sensitive. And if they feel there is something in there, they will just squat down, squat down, squat down, and everything is empty out. Yeah. It, some people think they're straining for the rest of the food that's stuck in their body somewhere, but it, you know, it's not been there. They, they just want to empty themselves completely. So it's, it's uh, well, people learn that very quickly, but well, that's they, probably. You can uh, absorb a lot of nutrients from a raw food and, and basically all the nutrients there, um, they kind of go to your dog's body and not just go outside, you know, like a kibble food. Basically, if your dog eats 100 grams of kibble, so probably he will poop like 90 grams of well, all of that, you know. The, 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 with kibble, it, it does the opposite of what raw meat does. Raw meat provides, you know, all the nutrients, the yeah. protein, everything that the body needs, but you also provide a lot of water. What kibble does, it, it robs the body from water because it absorbs water out of the body. Yeah. So kibble, it expands. So what comes out includes water. So yeah. it looks much bigger. You know, so when you, and you know now you can walk around and you can look at poop from dogs yeah, and you can, oh, kibble fed, raw fed, kibble fed, raw fed, you know. I can know, I know exactly which yeah. dog and when I walk on the place yeah, for with sure, for dogs. Sure. So, um, can I, um, sorry for interrupting you, I just uh, wanted to make it more clear that um, can you say, like, tell us how can we improve our dog's like immune system? If the immune system is basically the main or like measure we can, um, like, or how can we improve our dog's health with immune system? 
So how can we do that? Well, the number one thing is to remove things that are bad for your dog. And, and also, add, of course, the proper food. Proper food is probably number one. But when you start feeding the right food for a carnivore, dogs are carnivores. Yeah. Not everybody agree with me with that, but I will never, never say anything else. Dogs are carnivores. And if you feed a diet meant for carnivores, that's raw meat, yeah. And by you doing that, you also remove then the bad food, the kibble. So you're now feeding it. The, that's the foundation for everything. You can uh, give all the nutrients and vitamins to a kibble for a dog. It's not going to have a lot of effect. But the number one yeah, thing is the diet. Then the number two is exercise. And if you exercise your dog properly, then you, you um, also eliminate all the things in the body that should be there, toxins, chemicals, metals. Those things yeah. are eliminated through the lymphatic system. And what people don't realize, lymphatic system is not working unless your dog is walking yeah. or, or moving. So you need movement to move the lymph around and, and do what the lymph does. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I, yeah. in my opinion, the lymphatic system is the most important system in the body because that's the one that gets rid of the bad stuff. And yeah. it also provides good nutrients around the body too. It's not like it you know, do, just do, uh, only doing one thing, but the key is it doesn't have a pump. Yeah. And in order to pump it around, you got to move the muscles. So the muscles yeah. kind of, you know, sort of move the lymph around or, or make the lymphatic system function properly. Maybe so that's we what can, it's... Uh, sorry, but maybe we can separate the food and exercise. And maybe we can, uh, first of all, discuss the food issues and then maybe the exercise. I think it would be uh, maybe better for everyone who's, you know, who are watching us now. So... Can you tell how, what kind of a diet you can recommend and how it looks like, you know, how much meat I should give to my dog or oils or vegetables or something. So can you uh, like show well, What we want to do is, is to mimic a prey. So I like yeah. the prey model raw and if people don't know that, that is mimicking uh, an entire animal, you know, meat and uh, all the nutrients and things you will get from an entire animal. Yeah, and you can do that by uh, adding uh, different types of meats and uh, different organ meats is important. Two or three different types of organ meats, and um, and I like to mix in other meat groups, not just from one animal. Yeah, and by doing that, and then add a couple of eggs two or three times a week, you're very very close to have a very good diet. And variety is is the important part to portion it out and thinking about micronutrients and all that. I've never done ever ever. Yeah, and I just like I I believe we can never never create a balanced diet for any dog because all dogs are different. Like you, you and I, are different dogs are different and different requirement. Yeah, totally. and we will never know that. We would there's no way for us to know unless he has some disease or some sort of a, a deficiency, major major deficiency of something. Then they can find that in the blood and all that. But normally, if you feed a a, 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 a white wide variety of raw meats, some organ meats, and um, you, you getting, you're going to get very close to, to um, a balanced diet because, no, you are not balancing it. You just provide all the resources for yeah. the body, the dog to balance it. So the dog's body knows what it needs. Even look, look for things. Cells done on a certain level, level have little sensors that are looking for for different type of nutrients they need to build mm -hmm. cells and uh, new cells and uh, the body will know they know what it needs and, and if it gets too much of something they will either store it or just get rid of it yeah we the uh, dogs and, and humans have something called organ reserves and that's little um, storage area where they store nutrients to support its different organs in case of some sort of, you know, lack of food, they get into a situation and can't find food for many days, they will use these organ research to function. And, uh, but what I'm getting at is the body can balance itself, provided the right nutrients. For you to sit and try to create a diet with this percentage of vitamin A and B and C and D and all that stuff to try to make a complete diet, it's a complete waste of time for me. So it's kind of funny to read the, the kibble food packagings where it's written yeah. fully balanced uh, kibble dog food. So maybe I'm going to be uh, to my like second uh, question about the kibble food. You know, people are kind of um, 
uh, driven by the marketing of those big corporations, uh, you know, about the kibble food. Um, can you shortly describe your experience with kibble food and why do you encourage like people to quit kibble on, on their dog's diet? Oh, in my opinion, this is my yeah. opinion, based on yeah, sure. everything, because yeah. I'm many going to not disagree. I think kibble is one of the absolute worst things you can give a dog. It's so yeah. far from dog food, and because uh, it's cooked not one time, and often two or three times, and cooked at extremely high heat, and we know that destroys even even if the the beginning product could be. You know, some of these cable uh, packages you see organic meat, grass fed beef, all that, that is, is the, and, the, and those are the ones that pitches outside the boxes. And yeah. when you see commercial, these, these things fall from the heaven. Yeah. You know, they, they just look at the dog running yeah. on a field and usually a puppy, you know, even on yeah. kibble, look healthy. And, and it's so deceiving. And so uh, I, I just get sick when I see those because the end product. Of, of whatever the beginning, you know, the raw material from this cable, the end product is the same. It's the same whether it's high end, low end, old, because it's just cooked to death. So, and they realize that obviously because they add all these nutrients back into the food. And that, that's where you get these numbers from because somewhere, sometime, way back in time, somebody figured out the perfect balanced diet for a dog. Mm. And when you ask them, how did this come apart? Nobody knows, absolutely yeah. nobody knows. There's no science yeah. behind it or nothing. And uh, just a little side note, when the, when the vet is using it all the time, when you come in and say, my dog is raw food, oh yeah, you can't balance that. Impossible yeah. to balance the raw yeah. food. Yeah, yeah, no. And I say, yeah, I know, I told you no. I, I'm not balancing, my dog is balancing. And they just look at me weird. But mm. then they look at the, you know, they take the keyboard, and that's what people are programmed to think that when they're looking at the cable and turn around, oh, all balanced, look at all these beautiful nutrients and all that. What they don't realize, most of those are synthetic. And a synthetic yeah. vitamin and nutrient is not very recognizable by the body. Yeah. And sometimes the body doesn't even know what it is. And, and uh, it can explain why this happens. In, in many cases, the body will, don't think it's too, you know, they just don't know what to do with it, so they store it. And the place yeah. to store things that the body doesn't know is in the fatty layer. And that's what you often see in older dogs, these, these fatty Obviously. tumors, yeah. bumps. And they're not necessarily not gonna hurt the dog, but inside there is, is all these things that the body can't figure out what it is. And, and it could depend on uh, uh, Maybe we can also shortly discuss um, how much you know, carbohydrates are in the kibble food and also uh, yeah. what kind of you know, starch uh, that the companies are using to make you know, those beautiful kibble you know, pieces to stick together. So it's, yeah, uh, that's two things uh, the carnivores are not good at uh, absorbing and digesting. Yeah. The arts they can't do anything with. And uh, plant material too, the, the, in, in the pretty in veg uh, vegetable fruits in there and they have a very hard time digesting that too because of the the type of digestive system carnivores have, they're not set up for that. They're missing the enzyme, they're missing the bacteria in the stomach to, to break plant material down. And so there are many things in a, a digestive system, a wool, a wool for dog now, since they're so similar, that is, is not set up to, to uh, handle carbohydrates and starches. Yeah. So that's why we get into, you know, in my opinion, a lot of problems when you feed too much of that. Yeah, especially. especially yeah. And especially when kibble food contains, you know, around 40 to 60 percent of carbohydrates, which is basically yes. sugar. So it, um, that is so, uh, so far from what you find in wolves and things in the wild. I mean, I think I mentioned to you before that there yeah. are studies actually in scat, so yeah. that's the poop of wolves, the way they analyze them to see if they find any, they miss, uh, you know, that prey that wolves gonna uh, hunt on and, and kill their. Um, domestic animals like cows and sheep and stuff in, up, out in the wild and that's why these studies are done but they also analyze everything's in there and the most the most ever found in these studies it is it, it three to four percent of any plant material including fruits and and uh, berries and things like that so it's minuscule it's minuscule but and and some of this is almost in its original form it's not digested properly so I do believe, and I know wolves and things, you know, maybe in a famine and times where they have no meat or no food not whatsoever, 
they will nibble on some fruits and, and yeah. um, blueberries and stuff, but I don't think it's an essential part of the diet. They would be fine without because many of these studies have zero in it. It was nothing. They didn't find anything when it comes oh, yeah. to plant -based. I think it's, it's a really good time to talk about uh, fasting because as you said, wolves not uh, always, you know, had something to eat and they were searching somewhere, you know, uh, for berries or other uh, oh, yeah. kind of foods, you know, so, but most of the time they were, you know, making like intermittent fasting, for example, like, oh, you know, humans are now doing, but also I do uh, for Ellie, for example, she's fasting one day in a week, like yeah. 24 hours. No, I, I believe in that. I think that's extremely healthy because that is mimicking nature. Yeah. And uh, yes, dogs are domesticated, live in houses, but they still have a wild heart in them and, and the digestive system is uh, and the whole entire body is set up for not having or getting food every day. They can they'll be yeah. fine without food. And I think feeding once a day is, is something I like to do with dogs too. Because well, it's kind of interesting because most of the that's people sort of an intermittent fasting. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a pretty long time ago without food and I think that's extremely healthy it's for dogs. Really because when when they get into that stage it's sort of drifting into a little bit of a type of a ketosis, like a low end ketosis. But it also takes all the energy away from digest yeah. and they can use that to heal any other issues in the body and things like that so it i think is extremely healthy i mean not that even in humans people that come from areas where they do fasting and even there's some religious group that believe fasting is a very good thing to do and they're very healthy the, the cancer rates are lower in those groups and things like that so i think that's been proven many times that uh, fasting is, uh, is healthy and it, well, when you think about us in being in the cave you know, running mm -hmm. around in caves and hunting animals, we didn't find food every day. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. I think it's good for us too. Yeah, now, especially those biohackers are kind of, it's kind of oh, popular yeah. between the biohackers. And I do it for myself as well. And I really can feel the difference, even in my gut and how I feel. Uh, yeah. And also my energy level are yeah. way bigger. So, um, Maybe we can summarize some kind of, uh, you know, things we talked uh, before. And can you say a top five foods we should give uh, to our dogs? Like top five, if I can you know, show for everyone uh, your top five, uh, what kind I don't of... Know if, uh, if, I think it's, uh, I don't have any top five because of, uh, and I also think it's, you know, not right to do it in the sense that if people can't find that certain foods, they're going to feel, yeah. you know, some of these people are extremely sensitive and, and actually scared when they go into a raw food diet, mainly because of maybe a, some in the family, especially the veterinarians are against it. You know, most veterinarians yeah. against raw food diet. So they, they wonder if they're doing the right thing. And, and if I'm going to now say top 10, five food, I can do it, you know, what I do. And I think it's, it's, it's fine. So that's what I'm saying. It's only by, you know, by your experience and what uh, you implemented in your... Uh, well, but I, I diet. can get here. And it's often what you can get. You know, people in Australia, they love kangaroo meat. I can't get that here. And I, would, yeah. I wish because it sounds like a really good meat. So they... Yeah, yeah. So I probably... The main, they, I do chicken, pork, beef, and they do turkey, a lamb. Whatever I can find in the grocery store that's in on sale. I fortunately live in an area where they allowed to sell uh, maybe a, a, I shouldn't mention the store maybe <laughs> do me a favor or something because I, I don't think it's really allowed to sell meat past the expiration date but you know, uh, that's not... yeah but I don't but this is a really important question because sometimes yeah. I give for Ellie uh, meat which is already expired like one day uh, yeah. is it is it healthy or not because I thought you know that in the wild they kind of find some kind of leftovers from an Definitely. animal they probably would eat so so this is a problem right now, I think, and I, I, I know they mean well, um, these people that not pr promote fresh food. And that's very confusing to people, in, uh, at least they ask me, what is fresh food? Well, yeah. fresh, I mean fresh meat and, and also fruits and vegetables. Fresh food, in my mind, if I heard the word fresh food, I think about vegetables and, and fruits. <laughs> I don't think about them. Yeah. So I think it's a little... I know why they're doing it because a lot of people are offend, not offended, but they, they, the thought of raw meat is, is a little bit disgusting to some people. They, they're afraid of it. They're afraid they're going to get sick from it and things yeah, like maybe. that. But you're absolutely right. It, it, me, even when you buy your meat in the grocery store, it's still not fresh. It's probably frozen for a long time. 
the only place you find you know fresh food in a sense in in is in a market where you can go to a market a fish market or something and you don't find a lot of meat in markets but when it comes to vegetables and fruits you can find it there in a in a store it's not really fresh so i think using fresh food can make people think that they have to go and buy this raw food and then feed them right away and if yeah. it gets close to the expiration date oh no no that's the issue they can get sick absolutely not i had food because I forgot to maybe take out some when I had some food laying or, you know, gone over expression and really start smelling really, really bad. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and still gave it to my dogs and nothing happens. I mean, they yeah, eat I did it. the same and like she is alive. I, I gotta, <laughs> the chicken goes bad pretty quickly. Well, I don't I'm know how you with, buy, the, with the beef. I'm not a yeah, very chicken. But it, I don't know how you buy chicken in uh, in your country, but here they come in, you know, in these trays and this plastic. Over yeah, there. so it's the same in our country. Too. Yeah, but you can if go to the butcher if you want, but it's kind of hard, maybe sometimes to find. If you want that to last two or three times long, if you have a big one and and you don't use it the whole time and it went okay. in three or four days, just remove all of the plastic, and let be in the fridge all exposed. It's not going to hurt any other meat, but then it lasts much much longer inside the plastic it goes bad pretty quickly and you get that really nasty smell yeah yeah i know everybody done that they open up a bar that is sitting in even in yeah. the fridge it will create that smell so but if you open it up and let air come in this is one of those meats that actually lasts longer when it's out in the air than other that is covered with something so it's a kind of a strange thing so it that's a trick to make that chicken uh, but no i agree with you buying food close to the expression or over the expression they they that's a that's a big safety limit there you know they put the date way yeah. way before it can turn into something bad well, but I have work with food industry so yes, they're always yes, putting don't. you know three or two days on top yeah yeah but that's how i can get really nice and, what, what, and what about um, oils? Now it's kind of popular to put coconut oil, hemp oil, or um, uh, what kind of other, maybe flaxseed oil to your dog. Uh, but what, well, I don't it, think flax, any, any type of plant oil I'm not for, you know, it, the maybe exception could be coconut oil. Uh, and I, I don't have any proof of it or anything that is bad, yeah. but I, I, I don't see plant oil being as effective as animal fat, you know. To do it, but I do like so omega, omega so three from like, uh, salmon. So you're feeding uh, uh, animal fats. Yeah, no, I well, like keep the fat on the animal itself, oh, okay. but I do add omega three from fish, like uh, salmon and things like that. Actually, I get mine from Norway, which is one of the cleanest waters. Yeah. So I but add some of that. Uh, and uh, are you feeding your dog with fish? No, very rarely. Unless I get something, yeah. And also now it's kind of, uh, let's say, a booming thing to add vegetables to your dog's diet. Uh, what do you think about uh, vegetables? And maybe we can also discuss fermented vegetables in our dog's diet too. Well, since I believe that dogs cannot digest vegetables very well and get no benefit from it, and I know yeah. people have tried to eat their dogs a carrot and if they watch their dogs poop that carrot is going to come out pretty you know intact it's not going to be yeah. much going from it i think some of the carbs and the sugar might get into the body somehow but um you know i, 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 never, I never tested it, i had no proof of it but in my opinion they may lack the enzyme to digest any type of plant material including fruits and those things and um it, I, I don't see how carnivores can benefit from it. So I have never ever f my, fed my animals any veggies or fruits ever, but I don't say people shouldn't do it. That's just my personal belief. And it is part of my research to test that. And I have probably around 300 other dogs that never fed vegetables too. That isn't a special part of my research to see if we can, you know, see if we yeah. didn't run into any deficiency or anything. So far I haven't noticed anything. I have, on the other hand, noticed that bar-fed dogs struggle. Well, they, they do very well in the beginning. If they have allergies and other things like that, they do extremely well. But it seems like they don't fully, fully, fully get to the point where they got rid of all the allergies. Not everybody, but some dogs. Mm -hmm. And by removing the veggies and fruits, they seem to get in, into the last 
step mm. into really good health and the allergies and the hot spots and those things disappear. That tells me there are something in these vegetables and fruits that, that still create this some sort of inflammation and, uh, and can't shut it completely down. So, but that's just my theory. There's no research, anything behind yeah. it. And I know it's yeah. very popular to add broccoli and other things into the yeah. food. some studies out there that says it fights cancer. Um, I still uh, also, sorry for interrupting you, but um, you also have in your research uh, dogs with um, cancer cases, as I know, even yes. though I read. Uh, is the raw food diet help them? It, maybe to, to frozen or maybe uh, uh, well, just overall help them with, with the cancer cases? Oh, absolutely. I'm now to a point that if, if uh, people come to me and I share my experience from dogs with cancer, the ones that survived and done well, and all of the ones that done the best are, are all fed ones. The ones that survived cancer are all raw fed. Over a long three to five years, they're all raw fed. I've never seen a kid bull, a dog, to survive cancer with some natural you know, uh, products. That's and especially I mean. with uh, vet prescribed uh, kibble yeah. foods or something. And I'm not saying that to scare people or anything, but that, that just the, the experience, the data that comes out of my research, and I at any time have at least, well, it's around 100 dogs that had cancer that, that I share my findings with, then, you know, I leave it up to them what they want to yeah. do. But the one that sits strict, the really strict raw food diet, that, that I mean, um, with the low carbs, and add different supplements, they do the best every time. So, so absolutely, kind of... which makes sense. You know, we know that cancer cells do like, uh, you know, carbs, sugar and carbs, glycogen. Yeah, sugar. Well, they need important. sugar to, yeah. to get an energy source. It's kind of... Well, they're and, fermenters. Uh... They, they, they no longer can metabolize on fat yeah. and normal cells can do both. So these are fermenters and they need glycogen for that. and. Uh, and if you can limit that, they're going to starve a little bit. And if you have a cell, cancer cell starving, it's sort of done on its knees. And then you can hit it with other natural cancer killing supplements. And it seems like in the, those cases, it's much more effective. Um, I think we can now switch uh, to exercise. And uh, can you tell us how much our dog should exercise each day? You know, that, that really, I think, depends on the breed. Oh, the breed. Totally agree. But maybe... And, uh, I, I, I think a minimum, minimum is, is 20 to 30 minutes. Hey, that is absolute. You can do that twice a day. You're really getting into a good, good area of exercise and even more. And I know many do more, many do less. Yeah. But it has to be walked. It has to be exercised. It doesn't have to run around crazy or anything. You just got to get some movement going and walk the dog for you know, half an hour to, to, to 30 minutes and it makes a big difference. And then uh, I think it's it just, yeah. when you see these longevity cases and uh, Rodney has a really good case from Australia, that dog that yeah. got into the 30s and then what sticks out there is close their raw food diet, but the amount of exercise, it's like nine miles yeah, a day. Nine miles, time. yeah. I read that article but as well. That dog's gonna be so effective or purge any toxins and anything that can be harmful to the body is gonna be purged by the system that all that running. So the more exercise, the better, to say it that way too. So I think people should think a little bit more like, oh, this is so good for my, Dog and for their own health, you know, the same thing happens when you walk your dogs. You, your lymphatic system is working too, and because it's so easy for people, oh, it looks a little cold out there. Oh, it's a little yeah, windy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna walk my dog, but yeah. I walk mine, rain, snow, and shine, and that is what drives me because I know it's so healthy for them. And well, this feel that feel like, and mentally too. I mean. A dog that can use their their mind by sniffing. This is their way of getting the news. You know what happened last time I walked this place. What which dog had been there? Was you know that that's like their news. Is is yeah. it going on? Never thought about that. You know, it's strange. I've never thought about. Well, it's it's like it, it, mentally. It, when people say, "Oh my God, the yeah. dog is crazy. Yeah. Ate my sofa. Ate this and that." Yeah. You know, they just go on how much exercise. Oh, I don't really, I have a very busy job and I can't really exercise my dog and that's it. I mean, this is what um, 
disease in Milan is his number one thing. If you don't exercise your dog, you're going to have an out of balance dog mentally and physically. And I, I do uh, agree with that. Um, we, I also have a question. There, there is now in the market a lot of uh, vitamins and all other, uh, you know, stuff created. And what kind of supplements uh, would you recommend for a dog owners to, to boost their dogs? Okay, I don't, really, I don't want to mention any exact type no of supplements. Or something, so, just, okay. I don't know if you see. No, no, they, no, not that I don't want to share it. But when you when you go on these forums on Facebook and other things, and people in one supplement and one thing they add to the dogs that did this and this suddenly you have, everybody's doing it you know yeah, they're doing sure. it for for their oh this might help my dog so but even though there is no need for their dog no no I, I'll, I'll say in general because i think most food because the way especially in the united states it might be different uh, in your area um because of the um, the way we now fertilize you know everything with animals graze on that plant grows and all that well in lithuania we have kind of uh most of the time organic and neat no yeah the we're soil like, we're living in a kind of clean soil and yeah the soil is not what it used to be and, and what would seem to miss the most is minerals uh, yeah. any type of mineral supplements and if i should mention a few magnesium is very important i think potassium is another one selenium is another one and there are things that uh, that we all are diff deficient in because was, animal and whatever the food we eat lack it, so we don't get it through the regular yeah. food. And and sulfur is a big one. You know, sulfur is very yeah. deficient, and that get wiped out immediately by fertilizer. It's a very sensitive type of, of of mineral. But if you add sulfur in, and uh, I think that's uh, is. is all these minerals are so important in so many functions in the body. It's not like one thing. It just yeah. has so much to, to do with cellular health. So those are things I would you know, look into. In, in my experience is to, like you said before, switch the role through diet mm -hmm. and carbs. Yeah. And then you can start adding many, many good natural supplements out there that are you know, killing cancer cells in different okay. ways. And um, and also boosting the immune system at the same time. And if you can do that, the ones when you lose dogs to cancer is mostly because of organ damage. You can't. They, they, some organs are really hard to restore. And the the thing with dogs and and cancer is that we usually find out too late because yeah. dogs, you know, they can't tell us if they don't feel well and things like that. And and they actually genetically are made to hide it in the sense that one yeah. was so in weakness because yeah. you know you show weakness in, in a pack of animals you they kick you out of the club you know you know we don't need you you just eat and you don't hunt you don't do anything so we don't need you so they, they left alone being kicked out of the pack but in a in an environment in a home you they, you know we wouldn't do that and you wouldn't even know in most cases that they have cancer so you, you, especially if that's internal we just discovered it when the dogs can't hide it anymore. You know, that's and that's often too late. They seem they they done this uh, looked at organs uh, in in animals, and they seem like they can function pretty normal all the way to thirty percent. You know, the damage maybe is like sixty seventy percent is damaged by cancer, and the function is down by sixty thirty. And we wouldn't know right around that area. It seemed to start affecting the dog they can't hide it anymore and then we wrongly think that wait a minute my dog was perfect a week ago now it's it can't you know barely walk yeah. around it don't eat anymore and it acts so you got cancer so they think they got cancer in a week but yeah. that had probably been around for years and years and years yeah so it's that difficult and then we get to that point trying to restore because then the immune system is way down then if they choose to go an allopathic way of doing chemo or radiation and surgery and those things, the immune system go, uh, go even further down. And uh, when they stop the chemo and the treatment and all that, they, you know, the dog have the worst immune system ever and be very hard to bounce back. Um, can we also shortly discuss over vaccination? Because it's kind of also related with all of these uh, metabolic processes. Because yeah, now people well, basically are vaccinating their dogs like each 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 year. 
Well, I'm a believer at, uh, and then, you know, many people not going to agree with me again, is that uh, there is no need for vaccination. But if you vaccinate, they will last a lifetime. So you tell me you are vaccinated now? Uh, I, know, I, mean, most, uh, I don't no, know. No, I mean yourself. Well, yourself, you are probably vaccinated at one point. Yeah, we, I had a vac two vaccinations, but I was a baby. So it's kind of... Uh, uh, no, no, that's what I'm saying. Do that, but no, if I would choose, I probably won't do that. And no. even for our dogs, I have now five dogs. And two of them, they are not vaccinating, like, vaccinated, I think, two years or even more. No. It was the, the first time I heard about this over, over vaccination. And it's kind of, for me, it was like kind of, you know, wow, it's, it's like a logic thing, you know. It's basically a consumerism and all of the big corporations and medicine and so on. So, so think about it then. Why are you you're not going in for vaccination every year? Get your booster, get all these shots and stuff. Why, why are we not doing it to humans? But we're doing... I know the answer is easy because we are smart enough to wait a minute. Yeah. This this doesn't sound right. But a dog, you know, they can speak up. But we as humans should start a question: Why are we doing this every year? Why why won't we do it to humans? So that it, why what's the difference here? There's no difference. Is yeah, we know dogs, but it's not like dogs need more vaccination. No, yeah. it is a study that supports that. This is all completely made up in my opinion uh, they, they managed to get owners to buy into this vaccination yeah. craziness that has to be done every year they, they when you're vaccinated one time it, these these things are in the body for forever and yes they can maybe test them and we have something called tighter test and there are other ways to natural immunize dogs by expose them to the vaccination you know and the viruses i mean yeah. I know people that have puppies that run through their dog park with their dog hoping they're going to catch something and go home and hoping to catch something. And then the dog, yeah. you know, feel a little unwell maybe for a day yeah. or two. And then, they, oh, wait, that's the mm -hmm. immune. They're now immunized. Or, or well, it's, once that. again, it's an immune system. Yeah, and that's natural because it went through the mucus system, went through the nose, went through the mouth, that the mucus system mm -hmm. with, oh, wait, and wires coming into the body, they will send signals and antibodies will start being produced and, and it will treat it in a natural way. That's where you're supposed to be uh, immune to, to yeah. different viruses. Having something shot into your body, directly into your body, you know, with no, no warning from the mucus system or any natural way of getting this in, creates a cold shock to the body. And that's where you, you know, often get into these autoimmune diseases. But Probably the worst thing with vaccines is it's the carrier, the metals and things that are in the vaccine itself that goes into the body and, and won't leave and uh, hard to get rid of. I mean, that dogs that- Oh yeah, like they, they like a store in, in all of the body. And, in well, it, it, it's, when you take a dog that on kibble, take it to the vet and the dog, many dogs are terrified, terrified of it, like the veterinarian. And then, you know, they go, they go highly, highly stressed that on top of having a weak immune system from kibble, and then they're going to go into this stressful environment that the vet's office is going to bring the immune system even further down. And then suddenly you shoot something, you know, pure poison in the body and hope for the best. And that's why we see so many reactions to vaccine. Yeah. You see, why I'm saying that because if you are forced to vaccinate, like people are over here, where there comes to the rabies, that's law, you know, you yeah. can take your dog away for you, you don't do it. A raw fed dog, I've seen that it's over and over and over again can handle vaccination much, much better than a keeper fed dog. And there's no doubt in my mind that that is happening. And I had to vaccinate my own dogs and I never had a side effect from any type of vaccine for my dogs. Uh, and that's rabies. I don't like yeah. said anything any other than that because I have to do it by law. But I'm going to holistic vet that, you know, give minimal doses, but I also do tighter tests, which I've you know, done the last 10 years. The problem sometimes with vaccines and, and, and antibodies, when they detect to see if they're protected from certain viruses, is that if the body is not exposed to those particular viruses, they stop producing any antibodies for, for these yeah. viruses. So, but it's always kind of protected or hidden in something called memory cells. So it's there. So if they get exposed to any of these, they memory cells will be detected and bang, suddenly the production is out there and they will start producing these antibodies. But these memory cells cannot be detected if you, if you test for 
you know, if you have any antibody for these viruses, they wouldn't detect them in the memory cells. So then it was, okay, we need to vaccinate, there's nothing here. So that false, you false sort of information to anyone that testing dogs for, let's say, rabies five years after they are protected through their memory cells, but they can't detect them through any fighter tests because they're not active. So that's, you know, but talk to your vet about that and they're just gonna look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Are you not talking about your computer or something, yeah. Oh, yeah no. that nature is so amazing, unbelievable, yeah. much We can much all better. basically heal ourselves with uh, Yes, that's natural. what we said of absolutely give give the body a chance to heal itself and it will much better than any medication, drugs yeah. or anything. And that's very hard for people to understand. And it comes with yeah. humans too. We just need true, true, true. So I think it starts with, with, with the humans, you know, and also, you know, dogs are just, uh, they are all just dependent on us. Yeah. So they're kind of, well, I don't have any other questions because I think we can, you know, make a huge lecture with you. Um, so thank you so much for finding time to talk today with us. And I can't wait to implement all uh, your, you know, insights to, to my to my dog's life. And I hope everyone who is watching uh, us now will uh, do the same. Thank you so much. Well, I, I, I hope what, 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 well, I, I, I hear you very, barely can hear you, but what, what um, I hope people can take away is, and I'm trying all the time when I talk about this and not make it complicated yeah. because you can talk about this in such detail and make people afraid terrified of switching to raw because yeah. they're afraid of doing something wrong and the number one thing is being balanced food yeah that should be the least concern because the body will take care of that so for people and i noticed that if they just can get started on the raw feeding many sitting on the fence and terrified they read books about raw feeding many books out there and they and these books are listing the importance of balance and all that make sure you balance everything well, they're also afraid of bacteria in the raw food and so on yeah, that's that. I fed raw for you know twenty years here in the states and back home. I was around raw food as a kid, a baby, and never got sick. So I think it, the fear is it exaggerated. But people like to do it. The one against raw feeding, that's the number one thing. You know, you're going to get sick, and your dog going to get sick. Dog don't won't get sick from lamb salmonella. That's a myth. They will not get sick from yeah. it unless they have an extremely low compromised immune system. But even with that. The, the acids in the stomach, they kill most of the bacterial neutralizers and they won't hurt the body. And, they, and the dog's immune system is so fast that very little can colonize in the intestine is gonna be, you know, go out. And the body has an extra defense by if they detect this thing in the body, they're probably gonna create some kind of a diarrhea. And I know often a really effective one they call cannon butts, where they just shoot their stuff out and that's, Part of reaction that something is yeah, in but the body. that's how they clean, you know, all all no, the, all the no. bad stuff and all the bacteria. Yeah. yeah, so basically, we should just take a look at our dogs, um, like more as wolves, you know, and yeah. just think what they can find in the nature and what yeah. is there, you know, meant to eat them. So and, and, that's and mimic that, and don't worry about the balance yeah. in the beginning because the key, the key is to take the first step into raw feeding, and then people start educating themselves. They start because when they can see the dog eat. A piece of raw meat and he walks around alive the day after that's like the biggest step okay my dog is still alive i didn't kill yeah. my dog eating a raw meat. Right? and mm -hmm. the next day still alive still feeding raw well it feels better now after a week feeling raw food and the dog starting to show signs of improvement yeah. you know see a little shinier coat you know the less poop the smell and better breath no gas then they really the boost and the confidence and something wrong. Yeah, sure. Then they feel more, you know, encouraged to, to study more and start adding other food things in, maybe become a member of some other role food. I'm much more open to other things. And I find most people just self addicted themselves into becoming really good wolf eaters. And it's all about balanced food, variety of food. And, and the key, I always say, you need to start at one point with something, just start with, start with one little meat group, see, do that for a week, and they will absolutely see a difference in their dog, and that's gonna encourage them to keep going. So that's the key, but simplify it. You made it so complicated. 
and that's by design by other people that hate raw feeding you know they want to make it super fun. yeah so that's why i wanted to make all of these new podcasts because the thing is that people are now they were overloaded with the all oh the scientific gosh. researches and everything about no bacteria, raw food and so on. There's like a mind blowing. And I just want to make a short, you know, list top five things, what they should do just to start the raw feeding. Maybe then top five things, what they can, you know, include after, you know, one month of raw feeding and something, you know, something like this to make it yeah, more, exactly. you know, like simplify everything as much as we can. It's exactly why I wrote the book I wrote yeah. a, long time, a while ago. I will share the link about long living. Yeah, what, what I also, if, if people really want to know what I'm doing in, in details and have a dog with any problem, then yes, they can contact me. But I do all contact. this under a private membership organization. Yes, I do charge for that $5 a month. But I will share everything I have inside there because it's private. I no longer share anything in public. I don't share anything on Facebook because people have picked it up. They implemented yeah. my protocols I shared before in co and, and stole them. I made them their protocols, altered it and did other things. And any protocol I ever give out, I give specifically, specifically for that dog. There is any yeah. issues that they have chronic disease or anything like that. I, I try to tailor it and based on my parents. But if people really want to know what I'm doing, they can, they can join me. I, I figure out this is the only way I can share my, my private uh, information. You know, I, I don't want to go and load all these things on a Facebook page or something like that because it, it, it's well, not Well, you're responsible for your words, you know, so it's Absolutely. kind of uh, yeah. normal. Yeah. So, Dom, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for your time. And uh, I can't wait to implement. No, I, I want to thank you for doing what you do in your thank country. You, you know, you had so few people over there that do this. And uh, yeah, well, in Europe, we, you, I think I don't know even the person who are kind of trying. No, I, I know because I have, you know, I have thousands of thousands of dogs in, in, in my study, and, and they very, I don't think I have one, or, maybe one or two from your country and some of these more countries around that area, but that is extremely rare that I do that. But, but it, it's a little sad because you guys have good resources. That yeah, we have, that's what I wanted to say, you know, we have, you can even find in a butcher or in a, in yeah. a shop, a really, uh, you know, discounted meat, which is super good quality. And it's super funny, you know, when I read the, the ingredients in a, in a kind of premium uh, kibble food from United States, well, made in the United States, and they're, you know, uh, writing that uh, grass-fed uh, beef. And it's so strange because we do not have any other option here in Lithuania. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're all, you know, grass-fed. And, well, of course, yeah. there is, like, huge manufacturers. Yeah, but yeah. You, kind of, you, know, you know how to choose. So it was our grass-fed uh, butter or something. Well, it's it's really you know strange. Yeah, you go into a store, you can find grass-fed butter anywhere in yeah. a regular store. You have to go to like a Whole Food, which is you know health food type of store. No, it's crazy. It's absolutely yes. crazy, and that's what I'm saying. You're coming from a place where this could be really easily implemented. Yeah. There might be some cost issues, you know, like yeah, which which they anywhere, and some people can't afford to yeah. feed raw, but especially in tiny, small dog breeds, I don't see a difference in kibble and raw food if you're smart about buying raw you know, food. I have one more question about bones because there is also a part of, uh, of a vet, vet parents who are afraid to give uh, bones for their pets or for their dogs. Well, bones, I think, is a very important. It's, it's a good way to, to firm up the, the stool. If you don't feel any, bone, yeah. any bones, you know, but you need that calcium. So yeah. there are two ways if you don't want to feed bone because that's people are terrified of feeling bo feeding bones there because they're horror stories. And yeah. those horror stories came from bones not raw. But if you can't feel the two ways, either you need to grind it, you know, grind the bones. Yeah. And make it in tiny, tiny pieces and more all for that if you, you keep your mind, you know, peace of mind. And yeah. then uh, oh eggshells, if your eggs are from a farmer's market and things that's like awesome. that, that will work yeah. too. You know, so but it has to be bones in there one way or another, calcium in one way or another, and that's that I require that should be around 10% of the entire diet. And also, <sighs> maybe quickly, quickly, maybe quickly, if people don't know how much because that's how much you have feed, 
and you always yeah, it's very good. yeah 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 because you want to start uh, and as a thumb rule because every dog is different but yeah start around three to three percent that that both way i mean the, the preferred or the ideal way telling a lot of kids with dogs that you know overweight or soon to and then uh, you figure out what is the ideal weight, and then you start with two to two percent, and you watch your dog, and because they're all different, if they seem like it too chubby, you want to go down a little bit. But what I've noticed as well in the internet, because I read kind of a lot of Instagram stories or something, uh, people who are feeding their dogs with a raw fed diet, what they're doing, they're giving a huge portion of you know of meat. What I've noticed, even don't you think so that they are giving like too much food? When they start with the with the raw diet, yeah, no, I know. Sometimes too, I see these big bowls and raw meat. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Tiny dog. <laughs> it's, it's kind of you know strange. Well, it I actually harder to gain weight, you know, uh, on a raw fed dog. It's going to feel quite a bit over. So they do regulate it much better. But um, yeah, no, absolutely. I've seen dogs get fat on the raw food diet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you want to keep it on the lean side, and any dog should be on the lean side. And I mean, too time, too much time to walk, not you know, get into that. But at least you feel a couple of ribs. You feel the dog run, and you feel the couple, the two last ribs yeah. sort of can feel them. But the more about look, if you can look at the dog and you see your the hips, you know, from the from above, the hips goes in. Looking from the side, the stomach comes up, you know, a little yeah. bit like up. And the yeah. chest down, um, it's different from dog to dog. I mean, I have dachshunds that doesn't oh, yeah. doesn't apply much to. But um, no, you want to keep your dog on the lean side for sure. And if it's too heavy, you just got to feed less, maybe 2%, 1.5%. Also, be, it would depend on the activity level of dogs yeah. too. If it's a, it, you know, a sporting dog that go hunting and things like that, or other things, they're going to need much more food than a dog that just get walk and you know, walk a day. And the age of the dog too, and the many things that come. The best is what you know. Look at the dog. Yeah. There's no rule. It's no rule that this dog weigh this much should have this much food. It's two to three percent. It's just to start up somewhere. Yeah. And it's pretty close. It's going to be around there, because whether you fit two or three percent, it's going to take a long time for that to really make a difference. True. 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 Yeah. But again, it depends on that. Okay. I think we can uh, talk even a few hours or four hours even more. But uh, we are oh, yeah. really thankful for, for your time. It means a lot to me, even though it's... No, no, I'm, I'm glad we, we okay. found this out because I think we can do a lot of good things together. And I know, I know. Like, like this. Uh, and then if you have any questions or need any help for anything, you know. I don't know everything, but I have a lot of research yeah. from my own research I can draw from. I usually oh, don't speak anything outside my, my studies. I don't speak much about things that people ask me. And I, if I haven't experienced it, I don't wish my opinion. I just, I like to talk about things I've seen repeatedly happen. You know, if you've done something and you see it over and over and over again, there's something to it. And that's yeah. kind of how science works too. If you can repeat something, you know, one or two or three or four or five times, there's something to it. And especially with raw fed dogs, just taking the raw feeding. I mean, I, and you see my Instagram page where you, I post these success stories. I mean, I have thousands of them. And it happens almost every single time you go from keep to raw, you see these massive improvements. So this is repeated thousands of times. There can't be a fluke. I mean, if you don't believe me, then you also believe that every story I post there is fake, you know, because these are real story from people all over the world. And every dog improved on raw, some within a week, some takes two or three weeks, some take a month, three months, but they all, all improve on raw. And there might be some adjustments need to be done and things like that, but the basic is to get off this horrible kibble and get them off the raw food diet. Yeah, and in, I'm so in, glad, I'm so glad that we were talking about Well, it, 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 the saddest thing yeah, I hear in, 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 yeah, I know I didn't stop it, but the saddest thing I hear is when people come to, to, to tell me that the vets say that that yeah. the is wrong for a dog. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, because either that's a complete lie, and they just don't know better. You know, you would think becoming a vet is a pretty difficult, um, you know, education. You gotta be pretty smart to become a vet. So that's why I don't understand why they can have the, the decisions to move dogs away. 
Yeah, well, it's also, you know, we can uh, talk for like a few hours about even the vet situation and, and, and this, and yeah, but... I don't like to say bad things about veterinarians because I think we need them, absolutely need them. And, and they're great for emergency, trauma care, you know, urgent care, all that stuff. If something goes on to be the dog and you don't know what it is, you want it, you need to take it to the vet. Yeah. Extremely good at diagnosing things. They find it out. My vet is probably one of the most brilliant men I ever met. I mean, he's super, super smart. He knows every single time what's wrong with dogs. Unfortunately, I haven't never used them, but I have friends that go to him and, and he's extremely knowledgeable. So that's their main fun- focus, I think. When, when the Danes start talking about treatment and you know, food and stuff, you need to kind of pay attention a little bit and take back the responsibility for your pet and not accept exactly everything they say, but at least research it. So. But is they coming around? Yeah, I bet it's not more and more that acceptable for you. Yeah, here. well, I think uh, the more we talk about this, the more, you know, people are kind of, uh, oh, you know, they'll, their clients are talking about, maybe they will yeah. read, uh, you know, more, uh, more information, more, 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 build, you know, their understanding with a, a bit different perspective. And maybe, you know, we can uh, change this situation in, in five years. I no. hope so. I hope so. No, I no, exactly. And that's, that's part of the reason I'm doing what I do. Because if I can create 10,000 raw fed dog and get the data from them, it's going to blow everybody's yeah. mind away. There are going to be so numbers coming out of that research that people are going to doubt. But if this is repeated in thousands of thousands of dogs, there must be something to it. it yeah, there is a pattern, you know, with the Yeah, yeah they, absolutely. It's a trend and they, they, things are yeah. happening over and over. Even with cancer, the cancer reduced by over 90%. Of in the raw fed dogs, just that itself. Imagine that. I can't even talk about that because people think I'm crazy. Yeah, that, yeah. That's the numbers I'm getting. I mean, out of my study for 18 years now, cancer is down more than 90 percent. The very few dogs that get cancer that are raw fed. But hopefully, I can come up with it. I'm just gonna put the publish the numbers that are coming out of my research. They. Uh, when it comes to chronic diseases, attracting almost every single chronic disease. I'm going to see how many times that appear in these dogs in this study. And I'm not going to say anything. This is the data. I mean, just, yeah. I'm not lying about Well, you know, it's your data. You're made it by, you know, research. Yeah. And it's only, you know, basically our responsibility or our choice. Yeah. If we're going to seek, you know, for, uh, for your research, or we just kind of... Yeah, I have no reason yeah. to lie about it. I, I'm not benefited yeah. from whatsoever. I honestly wish my dog could thrive on kibble. Because then yeah. I can feed my dogs in five seconds. You know, be yeah. great. No, I it think takes it's one of the, the main point, you know, why people are feeding kibble because it's very convenient and that's all. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wish I, I, that'd be great. Now, I, you know, 45 minutes, but I love it. It's yeah. my favorite 45 minutes. And knowing and uh, making this food for my dogs is so good and they're going to yeah. live longer and they're going to be healthy and all that. Yeah. I totally enjoy it. That's my Well, favorite. dogs are our family. Dogs are our family. Yeah, yeah. We should all right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now, Thomas and I would love to hear from you. What's the most important insight you're taking away from this conversation and how you can put it into action right now? Please leave your answer in comments below. Thank you so much for watching and we will catch up next time on Hack the Dog podcast.